Great. So we'll begin. Uh, my name is Hani Mansurian, and I co-coordinate the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. Um, welcome to this webinar uh, that is on exploring the implications of the climate crisis on child protection in humanitarian context. Um, we're pleased to bring you this event today uh, to explore this, the existing evidence of the connections between climate change and risks to children's protection. Before I start, I wanted to thank the Advocacy Working Group for hosting this webinar as part of a series that, that they will be hosting. The Advocacy Working Group is an interagency platform under the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action um, that brings the in interested parties that would like to work on advocacy efforts around uh, placing children uh, in, uh, at the center of humanitarian response uh, together. So this space uh, allows members to uh, to exchange knowledge and, and join forces uh, in, in promoting the centrality of children and their protection. If you're not already a member and you're interested in, in advocacy and joining on, on the efforts of this group, um, you're more, more than welcome to do so. My colleagues can share the uh, information that you need to be able to connect with the leads of the, of the working group. Um, the conversation that we'll have today will help us inform the role that the Alliance and, and entities like the Alliance can play in, um, in uh, bringing the, the actors together and, and making sure that we work on the critical intersection of the crises, the humanitarian crises broadly and um, uh, climate induced uh, crises and how they impact protection of children. It is, it is a critical issue that is also featured in our 2021-2025 uh, strategy, which is called the Clarion Call. It is not um, only intuitive, but it's also proven by science that crises in general, uh, including uh, climate-induced induced crises, exacerbate child protection risks and threats to safety and mental health of children. And it further um, uh, exacerbates the inequities that exist, and, and it basically goes through an intergenerational pathway of impact um, that, that does not allow a lot of families and children to get out of it. And it exacerbates all of those kind of entrenched um, inequalities. Climate change is and will continue to be, to be contributing to increased conflict, displacement, food insecurity, financial hardship, structure of violence, as well as more frequent and intense droughts, heat waves, floods, fires, and other climate related disasters. In fact, the only glimmer of hope in this whole picture is the fact that children themselves are one of the key stakeholders in this in the climate activism, and their engage, engagement around the world has been really impressive. Given the impact that this crisis can have on risk to children's protection, child protection actors can play a critical role in building approaches used to prevent child protection risks, adapting protect, protective factors to help children and their families and communities better prepare for, strengthen the resilience to, and mitigate the negative impacts of the climate crisis. This session uh, seeks to explore the existing evidence of the connections between climate change and risks to children's protection, and discuss the role that the Alliance has a global network with more than 250 agencies, academic institutions, policymakers, donors, and practitioners can play in ensuring the protection and well-being of children impacted by the climate crisis. Now, I just want to make sure that everyone is aware that we're recording this session. I think you all got a notification when you came in or soon after. Uh, so if you have any objections, please voice that in the chat. Um, I also want to mention that we will have a Q&A um, uh, segment to this, to this uh, webinar. So please use the Q&A um, function uh, if you're not comfortable with the Q&A function, you can also post your questions in the chat. Sometimes it's difficult to capture it because a lot of people might be writing in chat, but if it's in, in Q&A function, it will remain there and we will be able to uh, come back to it. Now, I'll briefly introduce our speakers today um, uh, and we'll, we'll have a conversation with, with the speaker. So it will be a very informal format of, of conversation and you will get to benefit from their uh, experience, their research that they have done, and their and their views on this important topic. 
First, we have Bess Herbert, Advocacy Specialist on Corporal Punishment and Violence Prevention from the World Health Organization. We also have Domitila Chesang, a grassroots women's rights advocate who is the founder and executive director of IREP Foundation. And we also have David Bloomer, the Asia Regional Humanitarian Technical Senior Child Protection Advisor at Save the Children. Welcome to all of you guys, and thanks for making time to be with us. So I will be posing questions, going going kind of one by one, and then we'll come back to every every speaker. I'll start with Bess, um, if you're okay with that, Bess. Um, Bess, I understand that you have been part of some research on the connections between violence against children and climate change. Can you tell us what you have found from, from that research? And just to say, you have about three to four minutes for each uh, response. Great. Thank you so much, Hani, for the invitation to take part today. And um, thank you for organizing this event. I think it's such an important topic and connection to make. Um, so I recently did my dissertation on this, on the impact of climate change on violence against children. Some of the people in this screen were um, helped me with that, and I'm very grateful for that. So um, just maybe to kind of set the context, the climate crisis is the defining human and child rights challenge of our generation, and also recognized as the greatest threat to health and well-being, particularly for children. And UNICEF report that one billion children including many of the most disadvantaged and those on the climate front line are already today at extreme risk from the impacts of climate change. Um, and children's physical and physiological vulnerability and their dependence on others mean that they suffer first and most. And of course, they will also experience the impacts for longest. So personally, I think there's a very strong case to be made that children are the biggest stakeholders in um, climate action. So there's growing evidence of the, the impact of climate on children's rights to education, for example, but um, little hard evidence and very few systematic reviews um, addressing children's increased risk of violence connected to climate impacts. However, there are mounting reports and indications that, that this is the case. Um, the evidence is probably strongest in relation to disasters and humanitarian settings. And I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with this kind of evidence. So, for example, we know that um, following a disaster, girls report high levels of sexual harassment and abuse, enabled maybe by overcrowding in shelters, lack of privacy, lack of lighting, lack of separate facilities for women, of girl women and girls. We know that in times of crisis, we can see a breakdown in community norms and protective systems. And we also know that family stress is dramatically increased. So families, particularly those already living in very difficult circumstances, they may lose what little income or resources they have and are pushed beyond their ability to cope. So this forces families to make desperate decisions, for example, withdrawing children from school, engaging them in child labour, maybe arranging an early marriage. Um, and we know that stress levels within families go up um, and that that means that violence in families also increases. We also know that displacement creates huge risks for children. So for just one example, in the Caribbean, 3.4 million people were internally displaced between 2014 and 2018 by a series of catastrophic tropical um, cyclones. And that was more than six times the cyclones experienced in the preceding five year period. And a review of the impacts found that girls were at heightened risk of dropping out of school, being forced into trafficking, marriages, sexual, sexual exploitation and abuse. And we see similar patterns across human, other humanitarian settings and displacement contexts. But it looks like violence against children also increases in relation to many other climate impacts where there's much less research connected to migration, food scarcity, drought and conflict. And then there are other examples of climate shocks, for example, following wild, wildfires during heat waves in areas surrounding extractive industry. And of course, for climate child activists, 
where there's almost no evidence but strong indications that violence also increases in those contexts. So in summary, we're seeing increased levels of many forms of violence against children, child labour, child marriage and FGM, parental violence, gender-based violence, sexual exploitation, emotional harm and others across a whole range of climate contexts. So not a pretty picture, I'm afraid. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, Demetila. Oh, sorry, Bess. Um, I will come to you, Demetila, in, in a second. Um, so uh, a, a basically a, a, an important call to make sure that while there's a lot of, as you, as you call it, mounting reports and, um, and information coming out to, to really kind of gear towards bringing this into a body of evidence that can, that can help us um, advocate more, uh, more seriously and, and, and systematically around, around these issues that we are seeing that you described very eloquently. Thank you very much. Demtila, I wanted to ask you uh, if you kind of building off of what Bess uh, has told us from your work as, as a grassroots advocate, what have you seen in terms of the consequence of, uh, on child protection as a result of climate change and what has been the community's response to, to the changes? Um, thank you so much, honey. Um, yeah, um, just it's good to speak after Bess has given the evidence of the some of the findings that we uh, discussed over. So I work at the very grassroots level in one of the communities in Kenya. So, and uh, it's also one of the areas that has been had, uh, had hit by climate change impact. So um, so I'm very grateful to be part of this discussion because it just tells us that uh, there's need for us to connect the voices across the space and not just, just having a global conversation about climate change because uh, communities are also at the receiving end of the impact uh, and the consequences of climate change. So I am more than happy and grateful that I have this platform to just share on behalf of the communities at the grassroots level. So. Um, Working with girls and women as a frontline girls and women's rights advocate has been uh, a very challenging um, task. And uh, this has just been made worse by the, um, the impact of climate change. Uh, for instance, uh, I work with girls uh, and women who are at risk of undergoing uh, violence, uh, ranging from FGM, child marriages, uh, early marriages and forced marriages uh, and other forms of gender-based violence. So um, uh, working at the front line, it's just been, we've been making good progress. But uh, since we have started to um, witness the cases and the impact of climate change, things have just become tough and things have become very uh, tricky. And especially when it comes to uh, community survival measures because climate change has completely disrupted uh, the livelihoods of the people. The impact of climate change has completely uh, disrupted the livelihood of the people and uh, especially the people that uh, rely on uh, like pastoralist communities for, for example and uh, this has just also interfered with the, the, the programs and the measures that we have put in place to enable the community to um, impress uh, you know, like abandon their way of life, uh, the violence they've been uh, subjecting their girls to. So uh, the, over the last couple of years, we have witnessed increased cases of uh, child marriages and FGM. And this is also just directly as a result of um, climate change impact. Whereas our communities are now facing uh, extreme poverty uh, as a result of drought. So they are um, having to cut and marry off their, their, their daughters as a way of coping. So children are being subjected to violence or to abuse just as a way of salvaging their families or their community or their, uh, their parents from starvation. So, and, and uh, just besides that, it's also been a, a case of uh, children being pulled out of school to just go home and support their family in their their families in the survival uh, measures. So it's just been completely a very challenging period for us, and uh, it it also makes uh, uh, community organisations uh, working at the community levels to continuously um, have to come up with new measures, new approaches, and 
it interferes with how we do our things. And also it puts us in a very difficult uh, position because you have to think about the community. You also have to think about the girl and the woman that you're trying to protect from harm or from violence. But at the same time, there's a family that is uh, the verge of starvation. So this family want to pull their daughters out of school for them to be able to be cut so that they can be married off. And you are here as a frontliner trying so hard to communicate to your community that it's not right to cut girls and marry them off young. It's better to have them in school. But you know, education is a long-term investment. For the community to be able to see the impact of education, it will take a while for them to be able to see how they are going to benefit from that. So uh, as a short-term measure of uh, survival, is just to cut the girls and marry them off. And in most cases, the children are married off to older men, old enough to be their grandfathers, their fathers, their great grandfathers, just because these are men who have, uh, over time, amassed some sort, some enough amount of wealth. So they are well, they are wealthy or they are well off. So the children are married, and in most instances, the worst case uh, scenario is these children have to be subjected to uh, extra or uh, extreme cases of child abuse and violence uh, such as beating, uh, because when they try to resist the child marriage, they are beaten, thoroughly beaten, because the families require the, the dowry for them to be able to survive the impact of climate change. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dam Damtila. Um, I mean, it's so important to have your voice here um, for, for many reasons. Most importantly, that you work very closely with communities. Um, and and you you bring the the truth from where it's hardest hit. Um, so thanks for your intervention. I as you were speaking, I also was uh, remembering. Uh, I was preparing uh, a speech for another for another event, and I was doing some research, and it was very interesting that Africa, where I also live, I live in, in Nairobi, Dumtila. Um, uh, Africa has the is basically the only continent that is going to to continue population growth. So you're going to have more and more people yeah. in Africa, and and Kenya is no exception to that. At the same time, the the drop in yield uh, of ag agriculture is projected to be fifty percent by two two thousand one hundred. So in about seventy something years, we'll have fifty percent less food in Africa because of climate change compared to today. Now match that with the growing population. All of the problems that you pointed out are going to be tenfold. Um, that really kind of exp um, kind of tells us the, the, the importance of, of this topic that we are discussing today. Thank you very much. David, I'll come to you now. And uh, given your work as the Regional Child Protection Technical Advisor, what is the role you see for the child protection community in, in response, prevention, and mitigation of the impacts that we just heard about? Thanks, honey. And thanks, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here this evening. I'm going to try to be as practical as I can with some examples, uh, as I do work for Save the Children. Apologies that a lot of these examples do come from Save the Children, but hopefully there's some good lessons in there for, uh, for other organizations as well. So I wanted to start with this kind of uh, notion of uh, our work in child protection system strengthening, uh, particularly in humanitarian context, which is always a bit of a a bit of a challenge and a bit of a struggle as compared to more development-centered context um, and to focus on not just the response but also on prevention and mitigation and what are the ways that we're moving towards being more climate responsive and resilient with our child protection systems work. So we've started these sort of initiatives at Save the Children by bringing climate more toward the forefront of our existing programs, our evidence-based kind of initiatives in response, for example, or case management in particular. An example of this would be that uh, in our overall training package of, uh, on case management, we created climate, uh, climate change tip sheets and guidance notes. Um, in those packages, a sort of climate 101 for case workers, if you will. For example, you know, how, how does climate change impact on identification assessment? the case planning, the targeting, even in the closures of such case, cases that ensure tertiary prevention or harm not to reoccur. An example of our climate-informed cross-border case management work in Venezuela and Colombia, uh, where we've worked with community-based 
protection mechanisms to jointly design action plans and situations of climate risk and mapping of the most climate affected areas to identify immediate needs and in coordination with child protection and case management service providers, again, based on children at risk in climate affected regions. From the prevention and mitigation uh, space, we're doing something similar to what, we're, what we've done in response in that looking at our parenting programs within Save the Children, which we call Safe Families, uh, and exploring opportunities to work uh, in behavioral change approaches to things like climate. That also means we're working with uh, a global institution that Save the Children has called the Center for Utilizing Behavioral Insights for, for Children. Uh, in particular, this is really closely linked to what Domatella was talking about and to gender sensitive and the transformative, gender transformative nature of our work given that we do have quite a bit of strong evidence base of how climate is impacting on girls and women in particular, and how preventing and mitigating issues like early child marriage, again, what Dolantella and Bess, I think, both raised, and educating girls has really long-term positive implications on mitigating the impacts of climate change. I also wanted to make a link to the Alliance's own primary prevention framework and in particular, the protective and risk factors analysis tool for those of you who are familiar with it. I think all of us in the child protection area are working with some sort of protective and risk factors uh, tools. An example of using this protective and risk factors uh, analysis tool while I, while I was uh, assessing and prioritizing key drivers of sexual and gender-based violence in three Pacific countries earlier this year, countries that are challenged not only by climate, but also with SGBV, um, it was quite enlightening for the teams as they kind of dug deeper into understanding the drivers of SGBV and making a really, really strong link with, uh, with climate change. And then just sort of lastly, quickly, sorry, I'm probably about out of time, <laughs> but um, we, did, we did bring up this at the beginning on you know, the children's and youth engagement. Uh, and this is something that we're uh, looking to uh, looking to create a stronger link between what we're doing on the advocacy and campaign side with children and with youth, uh, and to bring that more into a kind of programmatic thing. The ch uh, children and youth are talking a lot about pollution and deforestation and water sources and et cetera. Is there a way for us to bring in these kind of protection links more closely with the work that children and youth are in, engaging on? I'll leave it at that, Hani. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, David, for those very concrete examples and uh, and also for mentioning the, um, the kind of the tip sheets and the guidance that you have created. It would be it would be great to point out if they if they're available for those that are on the call to be able to to tap into. Um, and thanks for mentioning the the risk and protective factor analysis tool and the and the protection prevention approach that that the alliance um, heavily has has heavily invested in and, and promotes. Um, Damtila, I want to come back to you. Um, we know that uh, climate crisis has cross cutting impacts for communities and require a multi sectoral um, approach to to be able to respond to it. Can you tell us how much we are seeing on the ground? at the national and the community level, these intersectoral approaches to responding to, to the impact of climate climate crisis? Yeah, so um, I think I will begin by saying that uh, the discussion uh, on climate change is still a topic that uh, uh, requires further and deeper uh, conversation across the, across the space. And uh, because of the fact that this is an issue that is still not well understood by everybody, as much as we are having this convening today to talk about climate change, but uh, the reality of things is that the communities that are being affected, that are paying for the, uh, the impact of climate change are completely uh, unaware of what is going on across the space and why they have to uh, be on the receiving end. So I will say that uh, this need uh, to have this conversation, not just at the global level, because that is how I see it now as a grassroots campaigner, that the, the discussion, the conversation about climate change is still a very uh, high level 
and uh, yet the consequences of climate change are already at the community at the grassroots level and that is why when i i started to talk i was like thank you for having me as part of this discussion because uh well um right now i appreciate the fact that there's a continuous conversation um at the global and also at the national level in terms of uh uh, how is climate change affecting the communities? What are the responsibilities of each and every one of us? And how do we um, link it up with all the other issues that intersect? And uh, I think uh, there is yes, some level of, uh, of work that is being done. I will say it's slow work, but it's some work. Uh, it's an effort that is being uh, put across, especially by the countries. For instance, uh, just setting an example, the Kenyan government hosted uh, um, a, a climate change uh, summit the other day and uh thankfully uh children were part of that conversation uh or no although it was still an issue that uh needed debate whether children should or should not be part of that conversation but that was um an effort that at least ensure that children were also being uh included and i had an opportunity of being part of that conversation and I, the fact that i do not work actively on the climate uh, change space but i was um uh, able to participate and present the issues of the communities in that platform. And besides that, also there is some level of um, improvement and conversion about climate change in terms of the, 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 the laws and the policies. For example, uh, also the Kenyan government, uh, uh, 2022, they enacted uh, laws uh, on child protection. And uh, at least with that uh, reviewed or renewed uh, policies and laws, it tells you that uh, at least the emerging trends, which includes climate change impact, is also going to be considered or has been considered because things are changing on, a, on an everyday basis. But uh, I would also just like to put a disclaimer that uh, this is not enough. What is happening is not, it's not even like, um, uh, it's not even enough it's completely still at the very global level and i speak from the grassroots perspective and i will tell you for sure that even at the county level uh, in my own country the conversation about climate change has still not yet been well understood so the first thing that should be done is to create awareness creating awareness around climate change knowledge is power when people understand what is climate change and what is happening around them is that as a result of this and that at least people will be able to make informed decisions and also i feel like this need to even uh, enhance this conversation about uh, intersecting climate change i mean like incorporating climate change in all the other sectors for example uh, education most children are at least in school, but how much of this conversation is actually uh, being integrated through the, the education system? So I will say there's some level of conversation, there's some work that has been started, but there is some reluctance and some laxity, and maybe also I will discuss that uh, in the next, um, in my in my next uh, discussion to just talk about what are some of the approaches that can be used to ensure that awareness is being disseminated across uh not just at the global not just among uh, you know big organizations but also uh, among the people that are actually paying for um the impact of climate change yeah thank you thank you so much Damtila. you brought up a lot of really good points uh, i'll pick up on on one that maybe you didn't even intend to make it an issue but it's almost a, a bit of a can of worms, but that's the, the the lack of equity element of, of all of this, that those, you talked about lack of awareness of climate change at the community level, but it's also they're paying the, the highest price when they have the least role in yeah. pushing the, the climate change and, and, and pushing the, the increase in, in temperature that we are, we are seeing today. So, so it's, uh, it's, it's unfair and it's, uh, and it's something that by creating awareness, you don't, you don't only allow them to make informed decision, but also to claim their rights and speak up and say that those that are that are more responsible for for where we are today need to um, need to contribute and and not just push down the the impact onto onto communities that don't have any voice. Thank you very much, and I will go to Bess again now. Um, Bess, zooming out to a policy level. What have you seen in terms of the awareness of child protection implications of the climate crisis in the global discourse on climate change so far? And how can we ensure responses are informed by evidence and research? So two, 
very easy questions for you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I mean, despite children's huge stake in effective climate policy and action, in my opinion, children are still largely missing in climate plans, processes and funding. And they may be increasingly mentioned in a list of vulnerable groups, but that's often it, you know, within a, some climate treaty or policy and concrete measures to include their voices and address their interests. And in particular, to protect them from heightened risk of violence is almost completely absent. And I have to say, I'm, I'm skeptical sometimes about, you know, we have children taking part in these climate uh, conferences or policy um, processes, but, you know, they have been taking part for a very long time. They've been doing a very good job, but how much are their views actually taken on, on board and represented? I think very little, um, unfortunately. Um, there are a few positive examples. So the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction emphasizes engaging children and youth as agents of change. And the Addis Ababa Action Agenda on Financing for Development recognizes that investing in children is fundamental for achieving sustainable development and emphasizes the vital importance of promoting and protecting the rights of all children. Um, but really, those are the exceptions. The majority of international climate policies don't meaningfully recognize children at all, children in general, and there's little, if, if any, recognition of children's increased risk of violence. There, is, there are more positive examples of addressing children in national climate plans. So, for example, in its climate change policy, Ghana recognizes the stronger impact of climate change on women and girls and aims to enhance their resilience through, for example, better access to social protection. And there are other, there are other um, examples of addressing children's interests in national plans, for example, the Philippines, Mexico, Colombia, and Vanuatu, among others, have, have done this. And um, the report from the Secretary General um, Special Representative on Violence Against Children's report on climate change did go through some of these good examples. However, UNICEF report that only 34% of um, NDC plans, that's the National Climate Action Plans, are child sensitive. So this is addressing children generally. This is not even focusing on risk of violence. So in most places, children and their increased risk of violence remains invisible to those developing policy and programs at different levels. And it's not just wrong, it's, it's a huge missed opportunity because children's ideas and activism based on their lived experience is such an important part of a long-term safe and sustainable approach. Um, so I, I just wanted to mention, that I think a positive development, a new, a new tool for all of us is the Committee on the Rights of the Child's recently published general comment number 26, which addresses children's rights and the environment. The general comment addresses the whole range of children's rights and the light on um, rights to protection from violence and increased risk. So the committee recognizes that environmental degradation and climate crisis as a form of structural violence against children and emphasizes the many impacts of climate crisis increase children's vulnerability to multiple forms of violence. The committee recommended that states should adopt cross-sectoral measures to address the drivers of violence against children linked to environmental degradation, including investing in children's services. Um, so I think we really need to keep advocating for the inclusion and addressing of children in climate policies at every level, from international to local, and really strongly making the case that child protection is a fundamental part of that. So increased risk of violence is a core component of children's experience of climate impacts. It's not an optional, interesting add-on. It's a central part of taking a child-informed approach. Yeah, I'm not sure if I've answered both um, parts of that question. Um, I think, we, yeah, we need to continue with our advocacy and we, we do need much better evidence and research. Um, yeah, we're kind of missing evidence around prevalence, around data. There's whole, there's whole countries that are on the front line of climate impacts that we have literally no research or no data at all. 
Um, and so that is also an important part of advocacy is kind of helping us to make the case and make the issue visible. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there Thank for you. now though. Thanks. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, just very good point on, on the issue of, uh, of the involvement of children themselves. I, I sometimes wonder if, if the, when adults come in and, and start messing with it, it actually makes it less uh, real and, and impactful when, when children are initiating their own activism, which we have seen for, for quite a number of years now. It's not a new thing. Uh, it's, uh, it's much more impactful. And, and I always am worried about the, the tokenism that when adults are, I mean, we live in an adultist society and adults are making decisions for both young people and old people. And so those in between are the ones that are, that have all the power. Um, so it's, I don't know what the solution is because it's not, the solution is not, not to, ha not to invite children either, um, but how to, how to make it more meaningful and allow them the space and in a way, just step away and create this, leave the space to them to be able to, to do what they do best. Um, and on, on, it's very, um, very glad that you mentioned the general comment 26. I was actually in a, in a meeting with one of the, um, uh, committee members and one very interesting element that she mentioned was um, that now governments in their in their uh, regular reports on the CRC are going to be required to specifically talk about how they are mitigating impact on children of of the of the climate crisis, which is I think a, a huge step forward uh, for all of us, David. Um, back to you. A core issue for the protection community currently is the centrality of protection and for the Alliance, a focus on the centrality of children and their protection. What are the synergies you see between this strand on the centrality of protection and how we seek to address specific climate related protection risks? Thanks, Hani. Yeah, you mentioned at the beginning, you know, for the, whether the Alliance, member organizations, the Dean for Save the Children, centrality of protection is a key a key initiative, you know, uh, and within that, we talk about protection being the responsibility of all humanitarian actors and protection really being the kind of top objective of all humanitarian action overall. Um, I think the link with climate where we see, you know, opportunities is particularly focused on, you know, mainstreaming and integrated approaches where we can address protection risks in other sectoral programming. I think we're, we're always pitching the idea for centrality and multi-sectoral program that children's needs are rarely in a vacuum. And they're more often than not, they're multi-sectoral in nature. Um, and I think we've heard that a lot uh, today. You know, and in the same way, climate is really impacting on children's education, their health, nutrition, well-being, as well as on the households and the uh, communities, the economics and, and livelihoods. So there's so many ways that we can focus on centrality. I'll give a couple of examples um, in terms of what we've been trying to do at, at, at Save the Children. Um, so uh, we're currently in the process of, the, of working on a multi-sectoral framework for sexual and gender-based violence. Um, and Within that, you, of course, you would normally see the uh, education and, and health and, and so forth, the sort of sectors that we would typically work with. But for the first time, we're trying to bring in climate change adaptation programs as a sector, because I think increasingly organizations do have climate change adaptation um, programs. Uh, we certainly do at, at SAVE. So it's like adding adding an additional sort of adding an additional sector, which adds an additional layer in many ways in terms of you know how are we addressing SGBV in this case from a preparedness angle from the analysis with it prevention mitigation and response again. One of the areas where child protection traditionally uh, integrates uh, well is with education and with uh, school-based programming, uh, safe schools and safe back to schools is a huge initiative with uh, Save the Children. It's a huge global one as well with safe schools declarations and so forth. Uh, I think there's an obvious link there with, uh, with uh, climate and, and protection. Uh, a lot is happening um, in schools 
around climate change awareness, green or environmental types of initiatives. Uh, so we're hoping that you know within those programs we can we can Im begin to embed more on protection risks that are inherent within within climate change, and indeed ways to mitigate that risk. Uh, as well as ensuring that child protection systems within schools are, are climate informed. Um, within the uh, mental health and uh, within the MHPSS realm, although uh, I think as a lot of people here will know, mental health and you know, psychosocial distress is a uh, risk as listed in the child protection minimum standards, it still is very much a, a it very much cuts across other other sectoral work, and I think we may not have as much evidence around the the impact of climate on uh, children's well being. But uh, I think that is an area where we're we're probably going to begin to see more and more. Um, so we want to make sure that our our work in this space in mental health and psychosocial support is climate informed. An example of that might be uh, we at SAVE, we have a child and youth resiliency program, uh, but it typically doesn't have a lot on climate resiliency built into that. Uh, so that's an opportunity that um, that we could focus on. I'll leave it at that, honey. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. I, I do have follow-up questions to ask, but I'll wait until the next question, especially on, on kind of preparing for uh, preparedness elements and, and all of that. Um, uh, but it's very interesting how SAVE seems to be ahead of the curve in, in basically the, uh, on, on all, everything that you're presenting, but specifically on this uh, issue of climate adaptation being seen almost as a separate sector on its own. Um, so it would be great to kind of see the learning from, from all, of that, all of that work and so that other, other organizations can also learn from it. Bess, um, back to you. From your research and experience working on ending violence against children, can you tell us about how you see the sector viewing this and what can we do to see child protection more at the center of policies and systems to address climate change? Hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, so in my research, I interviewed professionals, a small group of professionals who are working on the intersection between climate impacts and child protection. And I think the first thing to note is that very few people are expert in both areas and that there's very poor connection working between these two policy areas. So, for example, those of us who are experts in child protection often really don't understand the true scale and implications of the multiple compounding climate impacts that are predicted in coming years. So that kind of limits our ability to, to think and plan and strategize in this area. But I think it's even more important in the climate policy arena where someone may understand the science or the multiple impacts of flooding, but they don't tend so much to address the social impacts even more lacking is understanding of the particular impact on children and almost non-existent is the understanding of how it all increases risk of violence against children. Um, so the kind of very poor interconnection between these two major policy areas is a really big issue. Um, so the group of professionals that I interviewed were quite unusual in their expertise in both areas and what they said was that they were extremely worried. In fact, lots of them said they were afraid 